All right, we're back, and this is part two of the uh, time value of money, uh, solving for N uh, in single cash flow model. So uh, let's let's pick up from where we left off. Um, so in part one, um, we uh, we ended the video with the uh, uh, discussion, some discussion about the uh, uh, Euler's number, and um, uh, you saw the video also um, specific video uh, that was in, embedded in this. Uh, video, right, about uh, uh, what Euler's number is. So, um, and if I can sum it up, right, let me just uh, uh, sum it up in a, uh, a more compact way. So, our question was, uh, if we uh, increase the number of time periods. In other words, uh, we are trying to um, find uh, what this would be when we increase this M, right? So in that small video, right, they increased M to 1 million, right? And by the way, you all understand what this APR over M is. That's the periodic rate, isn't it right? In other words, if uh, annual interest rate is uh, 6%, and if the compounding frequency M is 4, right, uh, this would be the quarterly rate, 6% uh, divided by 4. So that would give you 1.5%, uh, right? That's the uh, that's also called the periodic rate, meaning you know the rate that applies uh, each period. You know each period uh, the principal gets compounded, right? So uh, in that video we put one there instead of APR, that's fine because one is 100% uh, APR and it can be 10%, 6%, uh, whatever. But one is a, uh, uh, putting one there is a nice way of uh, simplifying everything. So then uh, our question is, what if, this M goes to uh, a very large number, not just 1 million, but what if it goes to the infinity? What if M goes to infinity? Think about it. When M is uh, infinity, then APR over infinity will be what kind of number that will be. Uh, let me rephrase it or let me just uh, put one there to make it simple. Be easier to think uh, this way. So that means, what if that M goes to infinity? And we can rewrite it as one plus one over infinity, and the whole thing raised to infinity. Now, since you already uh, saw the video, you understand the meaning of one over infinity. That means, look, um, if we uh, increase the uh, the compounding frequency or uh, the, the number of times we split one year, right? 
So in other words, <clears throat> so far, you know, uh, 365 was the uh, generally maximum uh, segmentation of one year. But then in the uh, small video that you saw in part one, uh, they raised that to one million. But it doesn't have to stop there. As I said, you know, it could be one billion, one trillion. But of course, you know, for all practicality, one trillion, one billion is not really necessary, right? But, you know, uh, um, let's just call that infinity, right? I mean, infinity would be, you know, much greater than, you know, one trillion, one, you know. But anyway, what's the difference? I mean, a very, 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 very large number that we cannot even count or that we don't even have names for, right? Uh, we'll just call it infinity, right? So think about it. <clears throat> uh, what would this number be? One over infinity. Now, when I ask when I ask a question like this, very you know, oftentimes I hear some students, you know, just uh, <clears throat> just blurt out, you know, without too much thinking. They just say, "Oh, one in or infinity or zero. Now, look, some people just that just you know. Uh, blurt out one uh, or uh, infinity uh, are not thinking at all. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, it's deplorable that that is the, uh, the current escape or the current, you know, uh, uh, the reality of math education. Because in math classes, you're not trained to really think, but, you know, uh, some people are really, you know, they learn to think, but some people just, you know, pick up something, you know, like uh, when they say, oh, if the problem involves, you know, uh, uh, some complex, uh, num uh, complex uh, variables or complex, you know, uh, uh, concepts like infinity, usually the answer is either zero or infinity or one. Look, <clears throat> we can do a very simple thought experiment. I mean, it doesn't take that much, right? You should be, uh, people, uh, you must be trained to do some thought experiment because without thought experiment, people just end up, you know, uh, uh, being incapable, completely incapable of any thinking. Now, what is the thought experiment here? Look, if you divide 1 by 10, that's going to be 0 0.1, right? And divided by 100 is going to be 0 0.01. If you divide 1 by 1,000, then 0 0.001. And then if you divide it by 1 million, it's going to be 0 0.5 zeros, 1, right? So what does that mean? If you divide it by uh, 1 billion, it's going to become 0 0.9 zeros, 1. In other words, the, the, the greater the denominator, right? In other words, if the, the more you increase the, uh, uh, the M2, right? the smaller the number gets. And it doesn't take that very high intelligence. An av someone with any uh, average intelligence can easily uh, arrive at that conclusion by doing a simple thought experiment, right? So then what would be the result of dividing one by infinity, right? It cannot be infinity. It will be a very, 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 very small number. Isn't that right? Some people who would say zero, yeah, they are at least doing some thinking. Right? But because it's going to be a very, very small number. But just because it is a very, very small number, it doesn't mean it is zero. It will be close to zero, but it will never be zero. Right? 
And now there would be some other people who would say one. No, if that's also the evidence of lack of any thought experiment. How can it be one? To make it one, it would have to be either one over one or infinity over infinity. Right? So people who just, you know, uh, uh, jot out or interject, you know, anything that comes to my, uh, comes to their mind are just simply uh, exhibiting that they never did any deep thinking. And now the deep thinking doesn't have to be very, you know, uh, uh, complex one. It can be a logical, simple logical thought experiment, right? That simple logical thought experiment is what makes the, you know, whole difference, right? What makes it completely different, right? The logical reasoning. This is what I call the logical reasoning and analytical thinking. And that's what you need to learn from this class, right? The math itself is not that uh, advanced. It's not really like, you know, uh, rocket science. The math itself can be all mastered if you can do just some logical thought experiment, right? Now, anyway, uh, so, um, um, to continue with this discussion, you know, let's get back to our uh, question. Our, my question was, what uh, would this number be? And we understand, uh, now we have the uh, answer. This number, 1 over infinity, will be a very, very small number. Now, there is a name for that. There is an adjective for that. Uh, infinitely small number, right? So it is called an infinitesimal number, infinitesimal. That means, you know, infinitely small. So now we have a problem here. Why? <clears throat> what is going to be this, uh, the result of the whole, the thing in the bracket raised to uh, infinity? I mean, if the thing in the bracket, the whole parenthesis, if, uh, one over infinity is, if this is zero, then uh, the whole parenthesis is one, and then it will be a very simple, uh, the answer will be very simple. It will be, a, you know, you want, your life will be very easy because the whole thing in the parenthesis is one. If you uh, raise that thing to uh, infinity, it will still be just one because it's one raised to infinity, one times, one times, one times, one times, you know, infinitely times one, still one, right? But the problem is, it's not zero. It's just slightly greater than zero, right? So this whole number, right, the, uh, the whole parenthesis is just slightly greater than one, slightly, just, you know, infinitesimally greater than one. And if you raise that, uh, if you raise that number to infinity, what's it going to be? That's what we found, right, uh, in the video. That's uh, the result will be uh, an irrational number uh, that approaches 2.718. And once again, we don't use the number. We call it E, or Euler's number or exponential function e, right? Exponential e. Now, <clears throat> and this becomes the uh, uh, base of the uh, natural law, right? Why? Because when we take a uh, log of uh, a certain number, like, you know, uh, any random number like x, you cannot take the common log of that because, once again, uh, common log, you can easily take common log of numbers like 1,000, 1 million, 1 billion, 
uh, which are excuse me, which are basically powers of ten. And uh, mentally, you can easily do that operation, right? Because we know, you know, mentally, you can easily uh, uh, calculate what is ten, uh, what is uh, ten to the sixth power or ten to the ninth power. Uh, but if it is number like 1.37, how do you know what would be the exponent of 10, 10 that would arrive at 1.37, right? In other words, if that is not a neat power of 10, it's going to be very difficult to... Uh, uh, mentally process it. Of course, it doesn't mean it cannot be done. It can be done by a computer or by a calculator. But just with the human mind, uh, it's not that easy to uh, uh, cal uh, calculate that. So, uh, but then we can take the log of any random number to base E. Why? Because of this property of E. E is based on the number that is slightly greater than 1. Now think about it. If 1 is used as the base of log, then it's totally useless. Why? Because uh, raising 1 to any number cannot arrive at anything but just 1. Right? So raising, uh, using 1 as the base, uh, you cannot take the log of any number. But if it is slightly greater than 1, it will be a different story. So now you see why uh, we need to use natural log to take log of any random number. And log of natural log of x can be written this way or also written this way. ln of x. And of course, ln stands for natural log. Okay? So now, uh, if you're okay with this, I'm going to erase this and then get back to our... Uh, so then think about it. Our problem was we wanted to use z equals x times y structure, right? Because when it is in multiplicative uh, structure, then you can solve for x or you can solve for y, right? But we were, we had z equals x raised to y structure, right? So we had to uh, take the log to linearize it, right? So it had to uh, uh, then take the log of x, the left-hand side, and then you take the log of the right-hand side, and then it becomes this, this property of log, right? You can bring the uh, exponent down, just like a multiplicative uh, structure, right? Mult multiplicative function, right? So y times log of x, right? If you have forgotten, right? Go back to uh, video one and uh, review this part. But our question was, what is what is going to be what is going to be the uh, uh, base of the law, right? I mean, because x and y are all random numbers, we cannot use ten as the base, right? So that's why we needed to. Uh, uh, that's where this natural log comes in. So now we have natural log. If you take the natural log, because you can take any log of any number, any random number, if you use natural log, then it becomes natural log of uh, x raised to y, which is, again, then y times natural log of x. Okay, now, 
I know it's you know it doesn't look very nice because it's very hard to write on the uh, whiteboard <laughs> uh, using the mouse, but you know now you get the idea. We have f v over p in the left hand side, and then we have one plus r on the uh, raised to n on the right hand side and to solve for n we log linearize or you know we take log uh, and natural log on both sides okay so we come to uh, fv over p uh, natural log of f b o p and then n times natural log of 1 plus r okay and solving for n uh, if you want to solve for n what do you need to do if you solve for n then you divide natural log of fv over p by natural uh, you divide that by uh, natural log of 1 plus r right okay hence uh, we arrived that uh, formula and you might then you might say some people might you know uh, ask me a question they might say or complain professor i barely understand the concept of natural law uh, uh, logarithm and then you know uh, how do i calculate natural law look that's totally you know uh, unnecessary to you know uh, worry about that because you don't have to calculate the natural law you only provide this logic to Excel and Excel will execute it, right? You don't have to uh, bother with the calculation. That's why we use Excel. So I'm going to switch to uh, from, uh, uh, from the whiteboard to uh, Excel. So let me, uh, okay, let me switch back to, uh, Okay. Uh, application window. So, okay. All righty. So, uh, do you see Excel um, file? This is the file we've been using in class, right? Uh, the time value file, and you downloaded it. And I uh, last in the last class, and I've been telling you to save this work every time we uh, work on this file right after we work on this file you must save uh, the work because it's your work uh, you have to save it and uh, since we are going to uh, uh, since we will continue to use this file um, the uh, the work uh, needs to um, um, be you know updated every time you uh, uh, work on it. So now <clears throat> I want to go down to row 13. And, you know, uh, from row 13, I want you to uh, delete all the highlighted cells. Okay. All the highlighted cells. Okay. <clears throat> and um, what uh, I want you to go to row 20. And Row 20 is actually a recap of what we did we, uh, in the last class. In the last class, we solved uh, the you know, uh, future value equation for R, the rate, right? And in this example, the, uh, the, the scenario is you know, quite obvious. You know, there's P principle. If you have this principle, uh, you put this principle in the bank, and your timeline is five years. 
in five years, you want to grow it into uh, this future value. And the uh, compounding is quarterly. So what does that mean? <clears throat> uh, N would be 20 because um, there are four compoundings per year. So for five years, there's going to be four times five, uh, 20 compoundings, right? So, so our next question is then, uh, what's going to be the rate? And this rate means periodic rate. It's quarterly rate in, in this case, right? Because when compounding is quarterly, right, the relevant rate is quarterly rate, not the APR, not the annual rate, right? Now, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, <clears throat> but remember all rates, all returns, all interest rates are expressed in annual basis, right, on annual basis. So uh, we will eventually, once we find the uh, quarterly rate, we will eventually convert it uh, into APR, which is not a difficult thing. Now, <clears throat> once again, that's the uh, that's why the highlight is yellow here, and uh, APR is olive green. Uh, why? I, I I told you. I've been telling you. There is a meaning to uh, the color of highlights. It's not just randomly picked. It's not arbitrary. Um, the consensus, the co the convention is. Uh, you, uh, yellow highlight for the primary solution cell. That's the solution cell. Now the uh, uh, lighter, you know, light green or you know olive green. This is the uh, uh, <clears throat> reserved for secondary solution or uh, intermediate calculation, right? So uh, we will first, you know, um, because this is. Uh, our primary solution. So uh, we need to know what the uh, quarterly rate is. And you see, uh, I don't need to show this to you again. Uh, so we'll put that formula there, right? We'll put, oh, uh, we're, uh, we are, I'm sorry, uh, we are solving for rate. So uh, this is the rate where, you know, this is the formula we're going to put in there. So it's going to be, um, Fe P raised to one over n is in uh, F twenty, and you cannot click it in because the uh, the formula is covering that cell. Then in that case, what do you do? Well, you'll have to manually type it in F twenty, right? Uh, what I'm saying is manually typing in the cell. A uh, number, not the uh, uh, value of n. Why? Because that's called the soft co soft coding. Uh, whereas entering the actual numerical value is called hard coding. But you should never hard code. Why? Because once you do that, the formula gets fixed for that problem only. It cannot be reused or recycled for uh, other problems. Right, but if you soft code, this formula can be copied over and replicated in different problems of the uh, same pattern. Right, uh, so uh, that is the uh, that's the uh, uh, benefit of using Excel. If you have to uh, uh, enter the data every time you do that, then What's the point? You'll have to build a formula into it all over again, right? But if you, that's the downside of the hard coding. But if you soft code it, it can be copied and pasted into new problems, right? It raises efficiency, right? It makes your life a lot easier. So now the formula is then uh, minus one. And this is, uh, once again, called geometric average, right? And hit enter. We get this. And then uh, what is the annual rate then? This, since this is the uh, quarterly rate, the annual rate is simply that times 4. There you go. 
We got that. As soon as we these numbers are filled in, these cells are also filled in as well because I entered already uh, uh, in the cell that this cell is equal to this cell. So once I get that, uh, once I get this, this is automatically populated. And this one is also automatically populated because I already had put in there. Okay. Now, our next question. So, uh, row 21. And the row 21 is the um, paired problem. It's paired with uh, number 20. So, we already know the answer. Uh, N will be 20. T will be 5. But then, uh, we want to confirm that. Right? So how do we confirm that? Well, using the uh, formula for n. Uh, and then, so uh, what is that? Natural log of fb over pv. And once again, fb, we cannot click it in. So then I'll type in g21. Uh, and then over p, right? Natural log of one plus r. Okay. If I hit enter, it's going to give me twenty. And if it's twenty, then our formula checks out. Okay. So hit twenty. Yeah, I got twenty there. And then t converting that into years. Twenty quarters are five years because you know four quarters per year, right? So we simply need to uh, divide that by four, hit enter, it's five, right? So the formula checks out. Now, uh, we also want to verify this uh, by making this, this uh, equal to, uh, making our example equal to row six. Right, because in row six, uh, if if I change present value to uh, principal to ten thousand, future value to thirteen thousand for something, right, uh, the same number as that, then we should exactly get uh, for this. We should get you know six uh, percent, one point five year, and we should get you know uh, 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 the same result as that, right? So let me uh, quickly, simply change this to uh, make that equal to uh, that one, right? And make this also equal to that, right? Okay. So I got 1.5 for quarterly rate, 6% APR, 20 quarters, five years. Of course, you know, that was also, see, our formula really checks out. Now, let's go to um, row 13. And what is row 13 through 16 about? Now, let's think about it. It's also 5R and um, N. Um, but in this, in this example, uh, what's the difference? The difference is uh, this example, this model is um, slightly more detailed. In other words, uh, R and N are outside of formula. These variables are adjusted outside of formula, right? Quarterly rate and uh, total number of compounding uh, are uh, outside of formula, right? So the formula can be uh, uh, simple. But here, uh, that adjustment is not made outside of formula. So we'll have to make that adjustment inside of formula. Then that will make our formula more complicated. Okay? And so here, uh, basically, uh, we'll have to uh, F U. PV, right? F over P, and then raised to uh, uh, 1 over N. And our N is, in this case, uh, uh, it's going to be 
20 because five years and quarterly compounding, right? So two, it's not just five because there's quarterly compounding. So we'll have to make that adjustment here. So I we'll have to type in C13 times D13, okay? Oh, C, okay, here's something. C13 times E13, close the parenthesis, right? And then close the parenthesis again. It's only for the uh, uh, denominator, right? And you understand if I didn't put the parenthesis here, what's going to, without the parenthesis, what's going to happen is this is going to happen first, and then this will happen later. So we don't want that. I mean, it has to be, the denominator is a whole chunk. So that's why you put the parenthesis. It's always in a PAMDAS, right? Now, then minus one. So what do you expect? You will get, is that, but then, is that APR? No, actually, what we got there was not APR. It is uh, the quarterly rate, the periodic rate. So how do we convert it into APR? So then we will have to uh, uh, multiply the whole thing because that will give you the uh, quarterly result. And we must multiply it by 4. But once again, do not manually type in 4, right? Because that will be hard coding. If it is hard coded, you cannot use it in other, you know, uh, so, uh, situations. Now, four is in D13, so you simply divide, um, multiply it by uh, four, uh, that D13, and then you get this annual rate. Okay. Now, uh, n. So we know already it's going to be five, but you know, let's see if if it checks out. So take the natural log of future over present divided by natural log of plus. Not, uh, not APR. First of all, you all understand uh, the relevant rate is quarterly rate because we are dealing with quarterly compounding. So what do you do? You will have to uh adjusted or divided by adjusted by 14 okay hit enter and what do you think you will get there uh, you're not going to get five there you're going to get 20 because we are dealing with quarterly compounding so uh that's 20 that means 20 quarters but you have to answer in years because we are dealing with year right this the label says you have, you know, uh, you, you have to answer in here. So what do you do? You uh, to convert uh, quarters into years, you only to divide it by four, and four is there in D fourteen. So you enter D fourteen. Enter. There you go gives you five years, right? Now, in row 15 and row 16, compounding frequency is one, so it's annual compounding, so you don't have to bother with making adjustment. But again, it doesn't hurt. I'm going to copy that and paste it here. Oh, uh, look, um, uh, if it is 10,000, 10,000, this is not going to work. So I'll have to uh, uh, make it equal to that and also make it equal to that. Okay. Now it's going to be uh, annual 24.57%. Uh, right? rate. you notice that, oh, that's greater than this one. Of course. We are doing annual compounding here, not quarterly, right? If you're doing quarterly compounding, that means with a smaller, uh, with a smaller interest rate, you you can get to the same future value, right? It takes less interest rate 
to get the same future value. But if it is annual compounding, of course, the rate has to be greater to take this 10,000 to 30,000. Make sense? Now, uh, this should be pointing to, uh, for this example, it should be pointing to that. Now, again, I'll just copy this and paste, paste it there, okay? So uh, we got five, not because the number is copied, but because the formula is copied. But look, because uh, the adjustment is made, D16 is, right, uh, the compounding frequency, and in this case, it's one. Look, your one is not doing anything, right? It's completely innocuous, right? So in other words, although in annual compounding, it is not necessary to uh, use this, right? But the benefit of, uh, I mean, even without D16, that adjustment, you still get the same answer. But what is the benefit of, uh, this is more complicated, but what's the benefit of using that? I mean, well, it's because of the uh, 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 uniformity and consistency of the uh, formula structure. Because if you don't, uh, if that structure can be, is universal, because under any n, right, under any compounding frequency, it can be used. But if you don't uh, make, if you don't use this, if you don't make this adjustment in the formula, right, then it can only be used for the case where m is 1, right? Uh, so that is uh, less productive or less efficient. Right. If, if the formula can be used for only a specific occasion, then that is totally um, useless. Right. When the reason we are using uh, a computer model is because uh, it can be universal, it can be replicated. Right. Uh, so whatever is taking away that benefit of uh, universe, universal application, applicability, is not something we want to do, right? Okay, the same thing goes for this. I mean, this adjustment was not necessary, necessary for annual because it's one, and one is uh, innocuous, right? It doesn't do anything. It's harmless. But uh, uh, for the benefit of, you know, uh, consistency and uniformity of the structure, right? Uh, once you build the model, you have to always have the uh, uh, universal applicability in mind, okay? All righty, so that wraps up uh, everything about today's lecture. Uh, this, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, about how to solve for n in a, a time value of money single cash flow model. Okay, so uh, this concludes uh, part two of the video uh, of this lecture. Uh, thank you for Thank you for joining the session. Thank you. I'll see you guys in the next class.